here's what it looks like when you do not lead your target. If the target is close, relatively slow moving, the bullets are relatively fast, it's not a huge deal. We're not on the bullseye, but we're not far off. However, with a faster target, we're gonna be missing. With a far away target, we're gonna be missing by a lot. But if we calculate how far we need to lead our target, we can hit the bullseye at close range and at long range. I'm gonna get straight to the point in this video with the code that'll all make it happen. After that, I'm going to explain the math. After that, I'll show you the scene that I used to test this all out. After that, I've got some question and answers. And finally, some bugs that you may have noticed in some of the footage. Here is our code. This function takes as input the shooter's position as a vector three, the bullet speed as a float, the target position is a vector three, the target velocity is a vector three, and it returns a vector three, which is gonna be the position where we want to shoot so that our bullet intercepts the target. This same code will work in two dimensions. You just change your vector threes to vector twos. First, we're gonna calculate three floats, A, B, and C. There are some dot products involved in that. I'm gonna explain why that is the calculation later on. And then we'll use A, B, and C to calculate time, which is also gonna be a float. However, we're gonna leave time as zero if our bullet speed is slower than or equal to the speed of our target. Because if that's the case, we can end up trying to square root by a negative number or divide by zero. And we don't wanna crash our whole game if that is the case. Finally, what we return is the target's position plus time times the target's velocity. That's where our target is going to be when our bullet will be able to hit it. How do we call that code? Here's the context. So at the very top of that same file, I export a node 3D. That's my target. It can really just be anything that inherits from node 3D. It's actually going to be a character body. I'm in my gun script and I need to know how fast the bullet goes. Now that information is inside of the bullet. This is a gross hack, but what I do is I just instantiate a bullet and ask it how fast it is, save that to a local variable. Lastly, in physics process, I get the target's global position, save that to my target position variable. If I am leading the target, I just have a Boolean so I could turn it on and off. I ask for the target's position from that get intercept function. I pass in the bullet's spawn location. I just have a node 3D at the tip of the gun. That's just a consistent location for the bullet to spawn in. I pass in the projectile speed. I pass in the target's global position, the target's velocity, and I get back that vector three of the position that I actually want to shoot at. And then I just look at a call to look at on line 31. So my gun faces that target position that I want. And then I call shoot. Shoot instantiates the bullet. It creates a muzzle flash that I ended up turning off because I thought it was distracting. Puts the bullet as child of root and gives the bullet the transform and origin from where it should be spawned. That's all fine and good, but why does this get intercept function work, particularly all this math we're doing to find out A, B, C, and time? P1 represents our shooter's position. The black circles indicate where the shooter's bullet could be at various points in time, since we can aim in any direction, they're circles. P2 is our target's position. The solid green line represents where the target is going to be as time moves forward and velocity is applied to that target position. The dashed line is sort of where our target has been in the past. As time moves forward, the bullet has traveled further out from its center location at P1, but P2 is also moving. So what we need to figure out is where does the black circle intersect the green line? That's the position we want to shoot at it's where the target will be at the exact moment in time when the bullet can reach the same location that the target is at. P2 is our target's current position. V is our target's current velocity. T is time. So the position of our target at time T equals their current position plus their velocity times time. These are all vectors. If I'm being super pedantic, P of T and P2 are both positions. But in terms of our programming, they're all either vector threes or vector twos, depending on how many dimensions you're in. T is a scalar, or if you prefer, a float. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna take our target's position as a function of time. We're going to subtract off of that our shooter's position or our current position. And then we're gonna take the magnitude of all of that. Basically, how big is that vector? This whole thing right here is basically the distance between our shooter and where our target is going to be after a certain amount of time. We're gonna set all of that equal to the speed of our projectile times time to figure out when do they intersect so that we can get that time, plug it back in and figure out where. Speed and time are both scalars, that one too. Everything else is a vector. 
you can think of tee time speed as the radius of a circle around the shooter's position. We want to know where that circle intersects the line that the target is moving along. Now that means there could be zero, one, or two solutions depending on that radius. All right, think back to our code right there. Zero, one, or two solutions. Does that look like a quadratic? That's where we're going with all this. So this is what we're going to be working with. Our goal is ultimately to solve for t, time. And the magnitude of a vector is the square root of the dot product of a vector with itself. These two vectors are the same. All right, so squaring both sides eliminates the square root, and now we have speed squared and time squared on the right side here. In order to solve for t, we got to extract out all these t's and get them outside of parentheses, preferably on one side of the equation. How in the world are we going to do that? It seems really tricky, and we're going to have to use what's called the bilinearity property of the dot product. The bilinear form is shown right here where a, b, and c are all vectors and r is a scalar. And so what you can see is if you have this setup on the left, that is equivalent to this setup on the right with the r pulled out of those parentheses. And so we're going to need to apply this property three times in order to extract out that t variable. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're just going to worry about that dot product on the left and we're going to rearrange it so that it looks like this, so that it better matches the format of the left side of that equation for the property, right? Where this whole thing is A, T corresponds to R, the velocity vector corresponds to B, and P2 minus P1, which is also a vector, corresponds to C. So here's where we first apply the property. So this is what we just had a moment ago, and now we've pulled that T out in front. Now there is still two t's inside of the parentheses. So it looks like we have not made any progress, but I promise you we have. This form that we had just a moment ago corresponds to this, and this, our result right here, corresponds to this. We're going to need to apply that property two more times. So we're gonna rearrange what we currently have here to be this right here, so that we can apply the property twice. There's basically going to be two copies of, again, the left side of the bilinearity equation. And the correspondence here is that this V corresponds to A. T still, of course, matches up with R. V matches up with B. P2 minus P1 together matches up with C, and so on. So this shows that second and third application of the property. This is what we had a moment ago. This is what we end up with after we apply that property twice, the bilinear property. And then we combine like terms to get this right down here. Whew, it was a lot. We had a t out front, and when we pulled out another one, we ended up with a t squared. T's also got pulled out here and here. Those are the two like terms that we can combine into one. Now remember, the whole point of what we're doing is that we're trying to solve for t in this whole equation. Recently, all we've been doing is manipulating just the left side of it. It was equal to that speed squared times time squared. The next thing I'm going to do is take all the left side terms and subtract them off of both sides of the equation. Now, the reason I did the left side terms instead of the simpler right side, just subtract speed squared and time squared off of both sides, is because I want these negative signs here. There's going to be some nice cancellation later on. It's very minor. You could just as well have subtracted speed squared times time squared from both sides, and it would still work. Also, I'm going to combine like terms. T is what I'm treating as my variable here, right? So time is my variable t squared I've got in two different places, so I'm going to combine those into one term. This is a quadratic. Here is a, here is b, and here is c. And in between each of those, you see you got your t squared right there, you got your t right there, equals zero. To be very clear about it, here is our a, here is our b, and here is our c. This means we can use the quadratic formula to solve for t. All we have to do is substitute in those a's, b's, and c's that we just calculated. So going back to the very beginning of this math section, this is what we were starting with. What is our target's position as a function of time? And we're just going to substitute in for that t what t is equal to, that quadratic right here. It's not even really a function of time anymore. And it shouldn't be a function of time because we've figured out what is the exact time when our bullet can intercept the target, which we're using to figure out what is the position we should be shooting at. Now, if you look at the code that I showed earlier, you'll notice that it doesn't quite necessarily look like this. That's because I canceled out some negatives between the A's, B's, and C's here and the quadratic. B has a leading negative sign, C has a leading negative sign. I'm gonna cancel those out with negative signs that appear in the quadratic. 
So here you can see the negative signs that I canceled in the script, right? So B's got that leading negative, C's got that leading negative, and this is my quadratic right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm simply going to cancel out this negative and this negative, and then I am also going to cancel out this negative right here and this negative right here. And so this is what I'm gonna end up with right here. Just those leading negatives were canceled out. One thing we have to worry about is what if B squared minus 4AC is negative? And we're gonna try and take the square root of a negative number. What if A is zero and there's a divide by zero error? Fear not, friends, all that can be taken care of by one if statement. You see, the problems occur when our bullet is slower than our target can move. Now, you might consider looking back at the math and proving that to yourself, but for our purposes, I'm just showing you the if statement right here. If bullet speed is greater than target velocity dot length, then we are safe to use this quadratic formula. Otherwise, I'm just going to use the time at zero, which will cause our shooter to just shoot at the target's current position, which I think is a good plan B. The scene is very basic. I'm using Godot 4.2. I've got a world environment and directional light. My shooting gallery is just a node 3D with some CSG boxes for the floor and the two walls. I literally did my long range shooting gallery just by rotating this to the right and shooting at the far wall with another target over there. My camera 3D is what holds my gun, and my target is a character body with this model right here and a collision shape. This is the target script. It's super quick, super hacky. I just had a boolean choose between whether it's moving its velocity in the x direction or the z direction. And then it uses move and slide. The reason I have these two is because the two uh, shooting galleries are perpendicular to each other. Here's the gun scene right here. The root is a node 3D. I've got a model of the uh, blaster gun right here. It comes from a Kenny Asset Pack. I have another node 3D right at the tip of the rifle for where the bullet is going to spawn from. Uh, I had a muzzle flash, but I ended up turning that off. And then there's a timer for the fire rate of the gun. The gun script I've already showed you most of. That's where all the major work is being done for how to lead the target. There's potentially other places you might want to put it, but for this simple demo, I just put it in the gun. So I'm not really going to go over that code again. You can just scroll back to the beginning of the video and check it out if you want. I experimented with two different bullets, one a character body and one an area 3D. For the purposes of leading the target, it doesn't make any difference, but for the purposes of detecting collisions accurately and putting the little bullet hole decal on whatever got hit, there is a difference, and I'm going to discuss that a little bit more later on in this video. But here's the character body, which worked a little bit better for me. Bullet knows about the bullet hole decal, it's a packed scene, it's got a speed. Notice it's slow. These bullets are actually really slow. This demo will work even better with faster bullets. And then I've got the origin. Where is the bullet originating from? That's actually only needed also for the decal for orienting it. There might be a better way to do this. Please let me know if you know of one. Here's the physics process. We just set the velocity based on the forward direction of the bullet, speed, and time. Detect any collisions, and if there are, stick a decal on it, and then cue free the bullet. Bullet can also just time out right here. And here's the function to stick a decal on the target. We pass in the collision, instantiate the decal, get the body of the collider, add the decal as a child of it, set the decal's global position as the collision position, and make it look at its origin. This was my attempt at how to orient the decal. Again, there might be a better way to do this. The decal itself came from freepngimg.com, and I learned how to set the decal based on Modev's How to Create Improved Decal Slash Bullet Holes in Godot 4 tutorial. Links to all of these things are going to be in the video description. Questions and answers. The quadratic formula has a plus or minus right there. How come we're just ignoring the minus? The math doesn't really respect that our target is only going to be traveling forward through time. If it was also traveling backwards in time, then there would be two different solutions, two locations where we could shoot our bullet to hit the target. But since we're assuming that our target is only traveling forward through time, we only have to worry about the larger t value. What if the target is accelerating or changing direction? Answer, this doesn't work in that case, but nothing besides an instantaneous hit scan or a seeking missile would. What if the target is not using move and slide or move and collide, but is instead modifying its global position directly? Answer, it's not gonna work. Anything that invalidates velocity is gonna screw up these calculations. What if my shooter is also moving and the bullet inherits the shooter's velocity, which is reasonable because that's how actual physics work. Answer, in this case, you simply should be able to modify your target's velocity by subtracting off your shooter's velocity. And that should work just fine. My code isn't working like yours, WTF. So perhaps one of the most common mistakes is calculating shooter position from somewhere other than the bullet's spawn location. For instance, from the camera's position or from the center of the player. 
but then spawning the bullets from the tip of the gun. Please note that I am calculating the shooter's position from the exact location where the bullet is being spawned. The only other thing I can tell you is that it's really easy to have typos. Did you include a negative sign that you shouldn't? Did you forget a negative sign? Stuff like that happens all the time. But what if I don't want the NPCs to be aimbots who instantly look at their target? If you want to see a tutorial on like rotating a turret toward a target with a limited rotation speed, please let me know in the comments. I have that working, but it will have to wait until a later video. You may have noticed that hits on the far target aren't perfect bullseyes. They're high and to the right. I honestly do not know why this is. Ghosts? Rounding errors? Cosmic rays? I am stumped. I spent way longer than I meant to setting up the decals for this tutorial. Once I started using a character body 3D for the bullet, it worked perfectly as you can see here. Initially the root of my bullet tree was an area 3D rather than a character body, and I had a hell of a time with all kinds of weird glitches and bugs, such as decals that only periodically show up, bullets that hit the target but also sometimes pass through the target leaving a decal on the wall behind, so I'm asking you, why would I want to use an Area 3D for a bullet? Why would I want to use a Character Body 3D for a bullet? Because I've seen tutorials where they go either way on this. You can see my code here for the Area 3D. It's pretty straightforward. It uses signals from the collision body to detect if there was a collision. Now compare that to the Character Body 3D, which uses a move and collide, and then gets any collisions as a result. My theory is that that's simply a more accurate way of calculating collisions, and maybe the character body has a little bit more overhead or a bigger memory footprint for a bullet than an Area 3D would. But honestly, I don't know, and I couldn't find an answer to this question online. Please let me know if you noticed any mistakes, if there's anything wrong with my setup, just some bad practices or anything like that. I would really love to hear back from people that are watching this video. I'm just learning like everybody else. I've got a background in math, so I like explaining that part. I like teaching that aspect of it. But I'm also just like learning the ins and outs of Godot as a somewhat amateur. A GitHub link to my Godot project is in the video description, so check that out. Thank you for your time. If you benefited from this video, please give it a like and subscribe.